Welcome to Tech Talk with Trevor Galbraith, a video podcast that features industry leaders and experts from the electronics manufacturing community, recorded at major events around the world and from the studios of Global SMT TV. Now here is your host, Trevor Galbraith. Hello and welcome to today's show. Um, and uh, robots and cobots are, of course, at the center of a lot of factory automation these days. And uh, my guest today is going to uh, here to tell us all about it. He is the product manager for a company called Brooks Automation, uh, and his name is Tim DeRosset. Uh, welcome, Tim. Nice to see you today. Hi, Trevor. It's good to see you. Uh, great to be here. Okay. Uh, so uh, you're obviously at a very exciting time for your industry right now. Um, but um, tell me, what are, what are the company uh, origins of, of Brooks Automation? Uh, because you, you specialize in, in, I believe, in cobots that are used in uh, semiconductor manufacturing. Uh, so for the benefit of our, our um, viewers, yeah. please tell us a little bit about the company. Sure, sure. So Brooks Automation was founded uh, back in 1978. And uh, you know, they've grown over that period of time to be the number one robot supplier in the semiconductor industry. And they also specialize in vacuum handling and cleaning uh, solutions uh, also for semiconductor. And then more recently, uh, they've, uh, you know, we, we've also moved into collaborative robots and in fact are the number one uh, supplier of uh, robots, collaborative robots for lab automation. Right. And more recently, we've uh, we see tremendous potential of taking those uh, collaborative robots or cobots, as they're called, into electronics uh, manufacturing, uh, primarily in the applications of uh, PCA test, um, uh, test, tester load and unloading, uh, mm -hmm. handling. Uh, when you think about transferring uh, PCAs from conveyor to conveyor, or uh, you know, eff effectively anywhere that you have people handling or moving uh, PCAs uh, today could be a potential uh, application for uh, for our cobots and uh, given the labor shortages uh, you know I think it, it, it's a, it is an exciting time right right for sure so tell me when, when you're working in these clean rooms do you have to be uh, concerned for example about omissions uh, because uh, you know the, the the conditions within these clean rooms have to be so uh, sterile it's, it's unbelievable uh, is that an issue with with uh, automation like with robots and cobots well, certainly upstream in the semiconductor manufacturing, that's, uh, you know, that's critical and that's something that Brooks specializes in and does very well. But where we're looking at using collaborative robots in the uh, handling of PCA is, is a bit removed from that. It's still in a, in a, a clean room, uh, uh, but uh, the requirements are much less stringent. Uh, but at the same time, our cobots are quite clean. Uh, in terms of uh, particle, uh, um, you know, uh, particles within the uh, work cell or within the environment, but also uh, uh, ESD or electronics emission as well, is uh, they're quite uh, quite uh, well suited for those applications. Right. Okay. Um, so, I mean, space is, is limited in these factories and uh, also in screen, especially in clean rooms. Um, how do you limit the, the footprint of, of each cobot? Uh, and I'm going to show you a picture of the precise flex in, in a moment, uh, uh, but uh, maybe you can start to talk to us about the the footprint of these systems. Sure, sure. Yeah. So our, our uh, robots are designed uh, and were originally designed for lab automation, uh, but are moving into PCA test. And, and they're really designed with a, a, a tall vertical axis and they come in different, uh, different vertical axis uh, strokes or range of motion. But the major axes, as you can see here on the screen, are move horizontally. So we're able to move into and out of uh, fairly tight spaces. And we're able, because we're able to go vertical, and in this case is a Cartesian, which is also quite space, space efficient. Uh, but in, in, our, in terms of our SCARA robots able to go vertical, uh, some customers and, and many customers are starting to stack test instruments or stack equipment uh, on top of each other and going vertical as, a, as opposed to spreading out across the, the floor space and uh, saving, uh, saving floor space. Uh, the other element that's really quite unique uh, is the fact that our controllers are embedded in the robot. So there's no external controller. That's a, you know, often it's a bulky controller that when uh, you know the systems are integrated, they have you know, integrators have to mount their controller, have to deal with bulky cables and route those. Uh, we virtually eliminated that by embedding the controls into the robot, which makes them even more space efficient. Right, right. Okay. 
So, um, you know, the, the uh, maybe you could, can you tell us how many axes you have on each of these cobots and, and what is the, the range of grippers and nozzles and, and different attachments that you can put onto the arms? Sure, sure. The, uh, the, the robots range from a two-axis Cartesian, uh, which would be an XZ uh, configuration, all the way up to a, a six-axis uh, articulated robot. Um, but our, uh, you know, uh, our, when we think about most of the applications that are well suited within electronics test, it tends to be a flat to flat application, meaning that uh, the, the PCAs are, are in flat oriented and, and they're transferred and moved to another uh, uh, location still being flat. Uh, mm-hmm. or, or, uh, um, so, so for that reason, the four axis robots are quite well suited for, uh, for this uh, industry and these applications. Um, now, regarding the grippers and some of the some of the end effectors that go on, we have a, a ISO flange uh, design, so you could put third-party grippers on the robots uh, depending upon what you're handling. But we also have a fully integrated uh, uh, gripper that is a servo gripper that allows you to uh, control the position of the gripper jaws, but also the force that's applied depending upon what you're picking. And we found that to be quite uh, quite well uh, accepted within the uh, within the PCB PCA handling uh, uh, applications. Great. Great. So, so what um, safety features then are built into the systems? Yeah, so so safety is critical, and certainly as you think about uh, collaborative robots that uh, can work, have the ability to work side by side with people, uh, then safety uh, is, is even uh, is is always critical. Um, and one thing's I'll, one caveat I'll mention is that uh, any any cobot or robot really industrial robot before it's de- deployed and commissioned, it, it needs to you need to have a, a risk assessment performed just to make sure that there aren't. Uh, uh, you know, factors that might be, uh, you know, sharp uh, end effectors or sharp jaws, things like that could, that could uh, injure a person as, if they come in contact with them. But what's unique about our, our uh, cobots is they have a very low reflected inertia. And what that means is as the robots are moving, uh, they have very low gear ratios uh, on, the hor- on the primary axes. So if they happen to come in contact with a person or a, a delicate piece of uh, equipment or instrument, uh, they stop very easily. So we're able to move actually at a, at a, a pretty good uh, rate of speed. But at the same time, because we have low collision forces, we're able to stop uh, and, and we have some advanced control systems that, uh, that also enable us to stop. So, uh, you know, they, they, they work quite well side by side and working directly with people. And then, you know, also with, with any robot uh, emergency stops and some of the standard things that you need to need to have with, uh, with a lot of robots. Uh, we, we of course support that as well. Yeah. And, uh, and on, on the safety side, uh, we, we also adhere to uh, the ISO uh, safety standards for, uh, for cobots. Okay. That's fine. So, so are you using sort of LIDAR sensors to, to neg- negotiate your way around uh, the factory or people? Yeah, actually, uh, in in some applications, if it's needed to have a, a sensors or secondary sensors, uh, those can certainly be added. Uh, but for the most part, uh, the because the robots have such a low reflected inertia, uh, when they bump into a person, uh, they're going to stop and they're going to stop quickly, and uh, no you know uh, no injury or or, or uh, you know uh, you know. Is, is uh, occurs so so they're able to again move quite quickly but uh, if they happen to have an unintended or unexpected uh, uh, if a person gets in the way of it it still w- will stop uh, even without any any secondary sensors okay so uh, ha- how intelligent are the systems I mean uh, do they uh, connect to MES systems and um, do they have, offer for example full traceability yeah, so that uh, the MES uh, systems are, uh, you know, is, is a key component and uh, our, our uh, robot, you can think of it as a client to the MES systems and uh, the MES system or your, your workflow, whatever your workflow management system is, can communicate to the robot, give the robot instructions and the robot performs its task and reports back to the, uh, back to the system. And then uh, that that system typically would have would manage the traceability or test results of, uh, example uh, that would be managed perhaps not on board our robots, but our w- robots would say the the tester is loaded and the, you know and then the uh, uh, whatever uh, MES system is is managing the test and gathering the results. Uh, we would just uh, they would tell the robot when it's complete and they go get the robot 
out and, and instructions on what to do with it after that. Right, yeah. right. But they, they work, uh, they integrate very well with other other systems, whether it's MES or even ERP or uh, other, other uh, uh, factory uh, automation systems. Right, right. Okay. So, uh, you know, we're, we're living in a world today of um, a lot of um, reshoring happening, a lot of um, change within the industry. Um, are you noticing that as these companies reshore and, and set up new factories, is there a large uptick in, in automation, uh, and in fact, in the factory automation systems? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a it's it's uh, it's a double edged sword, um, and but I think there is a, a, a strong interest, and we're seeing a, a, a dramatic uptick in uh, interest around cobots and automating some of the systems, and particularly as with the geopolitical climate climate that we're in, uh, you know, bringing manufacturing back closer to the local geographies or local markets. Uh, there's, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, and certainly COVID has exposed uh, tremendous supply chain challenges that we've seen the last couple of years and, um, and, and really moving things back. So there's, there's a strong interest and, um, you know, robotics is a, an automation is a, is a, another way that companies can bring automation back either onshore, either within the U S within North America and near shoring and also in Europe. Um, uh, and, uh, they can, um, uh, automate and still keep manufacturing and in, in, uh, you know in local markets reasonably cost effective, but the other challenge that they're facing is lack of workforce and uh, right. labor pool as a challenge across uh, across most most all verticals and in, in industries. So that's an area in the past that maybe it was strictly a discussion or a, a decision made around return on investment. Uh, today, it's it's a matter, it's still a return on investment, but it's also a matter of throughput. If they can't find enough people to keep their factory running or to meet the demands, then they have to automate. And the decision making process is, is perhaps a bit different than it was uh, a couple of years ago. Yeah, I mean, it did used to be the case that um, a lot of people did base the question, as you rightly say, around ROI, and that robots, robots and robotics were quite expensive when, when you looked at it. But I'm sure with the amount of uh, volume that you're now producing in terms of robots and cobots, uh, these prices have come down. Yeah, I think the prices, if you track the price of robots and, and also even cobots, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the robot, you know, industrial robots over the last 20, 30 years, the cost mm -hmm. is the performance has increased uh, pretty yeah. dramatically over that time. Uh, sensing with vision and being able to uh, work in unstructured or less structured environments. Mm -hmm. But then with uh, more recently with cobots, I think as, as uh, more and more companies enter the market, uh, you know, you have to be careful what you ask for or what, you know, in terms of price, because there are some right. low cost competitors that, uh, you know, on the surface look, look quite attractive on the price, but uh, maybe the quality isn't there. And that's something right. that, you know, we build our robots in Livermore, California, and mm -hmm. uh, they're assembled here in the U.S. And uh, they're still quite uh, competitive on the price and, uh, you know, and the quality is, uh, you know, we, we, we stand behind. We think it's one of the most uh, uh, reliable cobots on the market. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, it's certainly, uh, you know, an exciting area. Is, uh, is there anything else that you're noticing in terms of trends uh, on, with with this um, automation? And yeah, I think that, yeah, I think the trends are, you know, companies are looking at where uh, particularly the labor shortage and where they're where they need people. And, and starting to look more and more at how cobots in particular can augment their production so that they can uh, maybe uh, automate some of the more mundane tasks that are repetitive and, uh, you know, and quite frankly, not a, not a uh, uh, you know, it's a mundane task for a person, uh, but then they're able to free those, uh, those people up to do uh, higher value, more meaningful work. And in the past, as we said, with ROI, it was largely on labor savings. Uh, and I think those days, uh, certainly for the foreseeable future, are, 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 have gone, that it's no longer necessarily about labor savings, although that is part of it, that companies aren't eliminating positions. They're doing position, doing automating the mundane tasks, and then take you know uh, training those workers to do higher value, more meaningful tasks. And that's uh, something that we're seeing not just in electronics, but across uh, across all industries. Yeah, I think I think one of the reasons that they're doing that as well is is because they're getting better quality. Uh, you know, when you when you replace a, a human operator with a, with a robot. Um, and the, the robots set up uh, correctly, then essentially it, it doesn't make mistakes. 
Well, and the key you, you touched on it is when the robot's set up correctly, right? Uh, and mm -hmm. I think a lot of times, uh, you know, I've been in robotics for uh, well over 20 years. And and sometimes I think in electronics, it's pretty it's a pretty advanced uh, manufacturing process. And they really have dialed in their, their process so that it can be automated. I think in other areas uh, that maybe are newer to robotics and automation, uh, a lot of times uh, companies might start to jump in and want to automate, but they first uh, need to look at their process and make, it, make sure that it's consistent, it's a good process, get the process right, and then automate it. Right, right. Okay. So, um, well, uh, as I say, it's, it's definitely um, uh, an exciting area. What have you got on your roadmap going forward? What's coming next for uh, Brooks Automation? Yeah, so we have uh, some uh, exciting uh, product development uh, coming down the, uh, you know, uh, you know, when we look further ahead this year, mm -hmm. uh, we'll be at the Automate show uh, in uh, Detroit in May, and we'll be uh, rolling out some new products there uh, around uh, machine vision. So, so incorporating vision into our servo gripper, for example, is one example, not to give too much away. Mm -hmm. And then we have next generation uh, cobots uh, coming as well uh, later this year that'll be, uh, we think, really exciting that will will improve the, the, the performance even further and uh, offer, a, offer a better product as well. And, and, and some of the other areas that we're also looking at is, uh, is in the range of uh, mobile uh, cobots. We have a number of uh, partners who are delivering our cobots today on mobile platforms. And we think that's also an exciting uh, growth uh, market as well. Right, right, absolutely. Well, you know, exciting area, and I'm, we look forward to some of these developments later in the year, Tim. And uh, I want to thank you for coming in and telling us about uh, Brooks Automation today. Yeah, thank you, Trevor. It's a pleasure to be here. And I think if if folks would like to learn more about it, if I may make a, a plug, uh, is certainly reach out to us at our website, brooks.com slash cobots. And mm -hmm. uh, feel free to reach out, uh, uh, and uh, I'd be, be glad to, to talk with folks directly as well. Super, super. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, just to our audience, before you go, just please remember to like, subscribe, and uh, uh, ring the bell, basically, so that each time that we bring out some new content, uh, you're, you're notified. But uh, for now, I want to thank uh, Tim DeRossett and uh, thank you for joining us and watching today.